Good day, Internet. We're here today, like every week, to talk about all things immigration. And you know, if you see uh, me, Senior Associate Attorney Ben Hamilton, here with Associate Attorney Andrew Craven, that we're here to talk about all things employment immigration. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about what is probably the most common visa that people have in the world, which is the tourist visa and what it is that you can and cannot do, especially as it relates to sort of business and investment and employment while a tourist in the United States. In case you don't know, we're part of Chavez and Valco, full service immigration firm, meaning we do everything immigration. Uh, and Andrew and I, well, we do everything employment based. So we're going to jump right into talking about the vaunted tourist visa. Um, Andrew, give us the uh, the definition here. What is the, well, it's actually referred to as the B visa. Yeah, so the B visa just allows foreign nationals to visit the U.S. for short trips, either for business or pleasure. If anyone looks up the visa or maybe actually has the visa and looks at the visa itself, they're going to see that it says B1 slash B2. So it's like, wait, what does that mean? So the B1 is going to be for temporary business trips. Uh, so that's going to your conference in Vegas versus your B2 is for short uh, trips for pleasure. So that's you know the family vacation to Disneyland or what have you. But basically what happens is when you arrive in the United States via airplane or, or land border and you uh, flash your uh, B visa to the CBP officer and they're going to ask, what's the purpose of your trip? Um, what they actually stamp in the passport is going to be based on what you say. So if you say, I'm going to a conference, they're going to stamp B1. And if you say, uh, hey, we're going to Disneyland, they're going to stamp B2. Um, so it's just kind of an indication of the purpose of your uh uh, trip. So uh, obviously an important thing is kind of talk about some of the basic requirements for the BBs that just apply obviously across the board. Um, so what are those requirements? Uh, so six requirements. First one just has to be a valid reason to visit the U.S. Uh, second to that is the purpose of your U.S. visit has to be to engage in lawful business or pleasure activities. Uh, you can't come here for your crime syndicate. Uh, three, the visit to the U.S. has to be for a specific duration of time. So you got to kind of give some information on how long you plan on being here. Uh, you have to maintain a residence in a foreign country that you don't intend to in abandon. Uh, number five, you have to have strong ties to your foreign residence. And then finally, you have to have sufficient funds uh, for the expenses of your visit. So, I mean, the first couple are fairly straightforward, right? Why you come in and since this is, you know, for temporary short visits or how long? So typically, you know, they want to see that your intention lines up with the allowed activities and that there's a specific duration of time. That's why you usually want to have a uh, round trip, you know, airfare. At the time you're applying for the visa, you may not have a ticket. You actually shouldn't have bought a ticket because you don't know if you're going to get the visa. But at the time you're applying for the visa, you should at least have fairly specific travel plans like, oh, we're going to go for two weeks or, or for a month. Um, Again, having to maintain a foreign residence is something that's actually very important. Now, does that residence have to be in your home country? No, it just has to be abroad. You can, you know, be applying in, I don't know, London, but you have a vacation home in the Caribbean that you intend to, you know, indicate as your foreign residence where you're going to, that's fine. Um, as long as it's a foreign residence. And, you know, obviously in cases where you're talking about younger applicants, this also applies to students. Um, that quote foreign residents can be like your parents' house. Um, one of the, the big kickers is foreign ties. Um, Andrew, do you have any examples of foreign ties? Uh, foreign ties being employed, uh, family members, uh, organizations that you're heavily involved in, uh, it could be a lot of things. 
Yeah, they basically want to see they just there's things that are going to bring you back to your home country. The number one, obviously, being a job or owning a business, having uh, assets. Um, obviously, foreign ties is kind of one of the number one reasons that they deny tourist visas. They just don't see you as having. Um, they, they, basically, they believe that you are uh, going to come to the U.S. and stay. There's not a lot that in, induces you to come back. And that kind of ties into the second point here, which is immigrant intent so um which the having a foreign residence having strong ties both kind of fall under this banner of immigrant intent um basically in u.s immigration law you are guilty until proven innocent meaning they start from the position of everyone intends to immigrate which is not allowed by immigrate, we mean apply for residency, not apply. Some some people get tripped up because they say immigrate. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm applying for a visa. They don't understand the legal nuance that um, immigrate in this context means apply for residency, not a visa. Um, that you have to prove to the officers that you do not intend to immigrate. That's why you have to show you have a residence and ties to your home country. Um, but sometimes you run into this tricky situation of, well, what if the applicant has um family members in the united states like that are u.s citizens or residents or what if those family members have actually taken the step of maybe initiating the first step of a residency process for the person who's applying for a tourist visa uh right or even you know if you already have you know family members that are citizens in the u.s but you know immigrant intent is really a big part of what they're looking at when you fill out what's called the ds-160 so when you're uh trying to get that visa they're looking at all of that information and really but when you fill out the ds-160 it asks if you have family members in the u.s and you have to like list them out so they're going to gather that in, they're going to know they're right. going to gather that information Right. So that's actually one of the frequent reasons why uh, B1 applicants are denied <clears throat> is because, you know, they really have to uh, overcome that and show that the trip will be brief and for the appropriate B uh, purpose and that they'll maintain that foreign residence and have those other ties to the home country. Yeah. So one of those common, arg common arguments you can make is regarding um consular processing and, and what's called visa retrogression basically saying well yeah i have a brother who's in the united states but even if he were to file for me there's a 10-year backlog actually it's more than 10 years now meaning there's absolutely no way i'm going to apply for residency during this trip of six months um so one of the arguments you can make obviously is that yes i have family members but i do not have any intention during this period to apply for residency um also sometimes you can have you know, a case already in the system, but you can maybe show a copy of the case to say, look, yes, there's a case in the system, but on the form itself, they selected consular processing, meaning, yes, I have this residency case in the system, but we're going to process it through the consulate, which is okay, right? Um, if you're going to do it outside the U.S. rather than inside the U.S. Um, so immigrant intent is one of the most important issues uh, that they look at. It's the most common reason for denial. Um, and it's all about what you're able to sort of document. Let's throw this out here. Um, having spoken with consular officers, one of the biggest things they look at, or, or a big factor, is previous foreign travel. Meaning if you've never left your home country ever, and now you're applying for a tourist visa, um, that's going to make it more likely for them to deny it. Whereas if you've traveled to other countries, obviously not the U.S., but other countries, and you have a history of foreign travel, again, which is information collected on the DS-160, um that can really uh that's actually a big factor that helps in your favor so it's all about proving that you have ties to your home country that you do not have immigrant intent so getting into the, the important stuff here because we're focusing on sort of the business side are what are some of the permitted business activities you can do uh while on a while in the u.s as a tourist um, so you can engage in commercial transactions not involving gainful employment. You can negotiate contracts, consult with other business associates, go through litigation, uh, participate in different scientific, educational, uh, 
business conventions or conferences, things like that, or undertake independent research? So looking at the first one, engage in commercial transactions, what are some kind of the key requirements or elements of, of that? So, I mean, kind of the main thing is that it is not uh, on an employment basis, but you can, you know, start making purchases, uh, things of that nature. Well, the key to understanding a, a lot of entering for business purposes is that the number one thing that is allowed is you're doing stuff on behalf of a foreign employer. So if I work for a factory in Germany and they want to send me to the U.S., to maybe sell some of our product that's being manufactured in Germany, right? To then be imported, you can you can sell, right? Also, that's maybe they're sending you to the U.S. to procure to buy some parts for the factory or maybe some raw materials, right? But the key here is that this is all being done on behalf of a foreign employer who is the one actually paying you. Um, so when you talk about consulting with business associates, negotiating contracts, engaging commercial transactions, it's you can enter temporarily on behalf of a foreign company for goods manufactured outside of the United States. That's kind of the really key element of pretty much all of our discussions around business related activities as a tourist on behalf of the foreign company where people get tripped up is. You know, at some point they've set up a U.S. subsidiary or affiliate, and then they have a business card that like has them as like manager, but it lists the U.S. company, not the foreign company. And yes, if they feel they need to, they will search your stuff. And I have seen people get nailed for business cards. Um, they can also search your phone and uh, computer because you have no um, uh, fourth protection, uh, Fourth Amendment protection rights at the border and they can search that stuff and see emails and how you kind of hold yourself out. So it's really important that it's, you're always a representative of the foreign company. Um, but what's something else and what's another key sort of thing you can do that, kind of, that falls under consult with business associates? Um, <clears throat> so when consulting with business associates, you can, uh, <clears throat> this can actually include a foreign national seeking an investment in the United States that would uh, later qualify them for status as an E2 investor. Well, there's always the whole chicken before the egg where people are like, oh, I want to get an investor visa. So I, I get the visa and then I set up the company, right? You're like, well, no, the company has to be set up. The investment has to be made in order to qualify for the visa. Like, well, how do I do that? Well, you, you got to get a tourist visa. I say, well, isn't that a violation? Well, no. A tourist visa actually allows someone to come in and basically take the steps they need to take to set up a company, sort of make an investment. Now, you can't operate the company. You can't manage the company, but you are allowed to do what you need to do to sort of set everything up. Um, that is totally allowed as a tourist. Uh, now, of course, the key there is going to be the transition between when the company gets set up and you apply for the visa. It should be pretty quick. Where I've seen Problems come up is where the guy came in as a tour, set up the company, and then two years went by and he was still coming in and out. This company was now operating. And at that point, um, the Department of State had some questions. Uh, but, but most of the time, they understand the, the whole chicken for the egg dilemma. And as long as it's fairly quick, they tend not to ask too many questions about that type of stuff. Um, what about uh, building and construction related activities? Uh, so generally, no, except for B ones that engage in supervision or training uh, of others that engage in building or construction work. Uh, but the person on the B one can't do any hands on work. Yeah, and this kind of relates to like, oh, I hired a, a foreign uh, architect or something, and they need to send someone in to kind of you know, sort of oversee some things. They're not engaging any hands-on work. They're just kind of doing some training, of that type of scenario. What about the installation service or repair of machinery? Key quote here, purchased abroad. Uh, so this is permissible and can actually include training U.S. workers to, you know, work on that machinery. However, 
the important thing is that the contract for the sale must actually require the foreign seller to provide those services. So a U.S. manufacturer of widgets wants to buy a cool new machine to make their widgets, and the maker of that machine is a factory in Germany. So they buy the machine, machine gets imported to the U.S., and the German company sends over like their, you know, one of their dudes, their engineers to kind of help oversee the installation of this machine in the U.S. factory, and then maybe uh, train some of the U.S. workers on how to use it and service it, saying, well, that makes sense, that's allowed. But the key thing here is it has to actually be, um, it needs to be in the contract for the purchase that, you know, they'll, they'll send someone over. Um, throw out another one here. This is just kind of a sidebar, but can you study while in the U.S. as a tourist? Uh, so generally, no, but incidental short courses of study, recreational or uh, avocational studies are allowed. So like your cooking classes or something along those lines that aren't a full, you know, learning to be a chef or anything like that, just for fun on vacation. Yeah. So you see people like, hey, I want to take a cooking class or I want to take a painting class. It's just like some, you know, thing that's for fun. Or maybe I want to do some English classes, but it's not like something for credit. You know, it's just like a couple of weeks uh, while I'm here. So, yeah, sort of incidental study is allowed. Um, are there any other sort of permissible uses, at least ones that have gotten kind of specifically named? Yeah, so uh, university lectures, uh, religious and charitable activities, uh, international affairs or exhibitors, uh, some professional entertainers in very limited circumstance, and members of board of directors and professional athletes. Some of these make sense. If I have you know, board of directors and a couple of them are foreigners and we need to have a board meeting, so a couple of these guys come in for the board meeting. That makes, you know, sense. And like a university lecturer who may come in and just give sort of one lecture, you know, on a Friday and then leave um, certain things like that. Or again, religious charitable activities. Again, maybe a, a visiting pastor is going to swing by and give a sermon on, on one Sunday and, and, and go. Um, those seem to make sense. Professional entertainers, though, that seems like something that would require like you to get a P visa or something beforehand. Uh, so this actually covers activities like uh, competitions where you're just going to win prize money or a musician just using a recording studio, a creation of art not sold in the U.S. Yeah, so if you're like uh, Ed Sheeran, right, and you're just like, hey... I, I, you know, I got my own money, uh, but I'm going to record a new song. And I want to do it at the studio in Los Angeles. Like no one's like, I'm not getting paid necessarily for it. Like I'm not getting a salary. Like I can come in and record the song and then leave. Right. You don't really need a visa for that as opposed to like, oh, no, I'm coming in for a concert tour. And obviously I'm going to be, you know, getting paid and stuff. That's totally different. And you're looking at like the P or the O um, as an option. And, and you also we mentioned professional athletes right this seems like that would also require maybe a p or or an o depending uh yeah so this would be more for things like tryouts or a foreign-based team playing in the u.s yeah so like we know over the summer you know they'll do like soccer friendly matches like where real madrid will come and play or barcelona will come in and play a one game versus like an mls team and it's like well it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to like they have to go through the whole process of getting a bunch of visas for these guys, um, especially when they, you know they work. They're employed by a foreign team that plays in a foreign league, and they're paying employed abroad. They're just coming in for like this one game, um, or like again tryouts. I, I want to, you know, try out this Spanish basketball player to see if he's going to make my NBA team. Um, obviously, if I decide that we're going to sign a contract with him, then of course he's going to need like a P or an O. Um, but, you know, for him just to come and try out, not, it's not necessarily required. Um, so all of these things, now we're going to talk about kind of an important factor that applies to all of these is payment from a U.S. source, right? One of the key elements that we talked about is, hey, I'm working on behalf of a foreign company. I'm being paid by the foreign company. Um, 
can a B1 receive payment from a US source? Uh, so basically, no. Uh, on a B1, any kind of salary, wage, remuneration, uh, can't be paid from a U.S. and there can't be like this chargeback situation where the foreign firm uh, basically gets reimbursed by the U.S. company and then, you know, continues to use that money to pay the person. Are there uh, are there any exceptions? So the U.S. company can provide an expense account or reimbursement for incidental expenses for the whole visit. So things like uh, the travel, meals, laundry, lodging, and just kind of your basic uh, cost of travel. So if it's like, hey, we're going to bring over this uh, pastor to give a, a sermon. I can offer to pay like, hey, we'll pay, we'll pay your airfare. We'll, we'll pay for your hotel, um, you know, some meals like, OK, OK. And then, you know, here's 2K for your for your troubles. It's like, well, that, the first part was OK, um, <laughs> paying for their like expense, the travel expenses, but then giving them offering them any type of what could be conceived as, as you know, uh, s salary. And it's really, you know, any type of compensation for work done in the US is basically not allowed. I mean, another ex another exception, of course, is um, passive income. So if I own a US business or I own a US asset or something, and I'm not actively managing it, I'm just kind of coming in and out, but I am receiving dividends or profits, um, that's fine. Passive income is not going to impact someone coming in as, as, as a tourist visa. Um, but you know, any type of thing that's construed as work for some type of pay, um, is a strict, uh, no, no. So again, one of the keys is always going back to if you're coming in for business. It's usually on behalf of a foreign company, foreign entity, and you're getting paid by the foreign uh, company. The U S company may basically only offer to cover the cost of your, your travel. Um, so we're going to delve into kind of an interesting little topic. It's one of these things where they took a whole category of people that you think should probably have their own visa, but then decided to kind of pigeonhole it underneath the tour, under the tourist visa. I'll give you another uh, example of this. A lot of people don't know that the H-1B is for professionals, but it also includes fashion models. We're just kind of stuck in, slipped in there. And you're like, okay, what does fashion models have to do with H-1Bs? Uh, but anyway, it's just there. So the one we're talking about is domestic employees. Domestic employees is actually someone who gets a B visa, because for whatever reason, it's underneath the B, uh, but actually is allowed to work uh, in the United States. So what is a domestic employee? Uh, so this would include uh, housekeepers, so chauffeurs, cooks, uh, maids, parlor maids, butlers, valets, footmen, gardeners, nannies, au pairs, uh, caretakers, paid companions, uh, and you know, just kind of anything that fits into that group. <laughs> First off, we had the interesting uh, discussion earlier about what's a footman, and <laughs> I guess Andrew hasn't seen uh, uh, Downton Abbey um, to know what a footman I is. The one that caught my eye was enough. paid. Was paid companions? I was like, what's a paid companion? That sounds a little sketchy. But anyway, generally in our experience, what it applies to is nannies and maids. Uh, or sometimes it can be like a, like a caregiver, like somebody who is in the U.S. and they have like a kind of like a live-in nurse type thing. Um, most of the time, again, we see it's, it's nannies is the most common, sometimes maids, sometimes caregivers. Uh, so first question. Sometimes U.S. citizens see this and they're like, oh, man, I need a nanny. I can get this nanny from Mexico. Cool. Um, can a U.S. citizen use a B-1 domestic employee? Uh, so they may employ a B-1 domestic employee if the U.S. citizen maintains a permanent home or is stationed abroad, but will visit the United States temporarily. Um <clears throat> So the U.S. citizen employer also is subject to frequent international transfers lasting two years or more, 
uh, and is temporarily assigned to the U.S. So basically, if you're a U.S. citizen who's traveling a lot or you work in another country, uh, things along those uh, lines. Yeah. So can a U.S. citizen get a B-1 domestic employee 99% of the time? No, right? This is not for that. Um, there, because there, you know, a B one is temporary, meaning the employer would also have to be temporary, because otherwise, a U.S. citizen is is permanent and they could work for you forever. That that sort of defeats the purpose of this. It's like, no, if you're like a U.S. citizen, you work for I don't know an oil and gas company, and you work for them in Ecuador, and you hired a nanny there, and now you need to come back to the U.S. for a short period, uh, maybe a couple of months. Yes, you can bring that nanny with you, but if you're of course moving back to the U.S. permanently, no. Uh, you can't. So U.S. citizens can use this in very limited circumstances, but you basically have to prove that you principally live outside of the U.S. and that you're uh, coming in. So obviously the most common use of this is can a foreign national in, in the U.S. employ a B-1 domestic employee? Uh, yeah. So in general, a foreign national who holds just any non-immigrant status can sponsor a B-1 domestic employee. So generally where we see this is the guy's like, oh, I just got my L visa. Oh, I just got my E visa. Can I bring my nanny? Uh, can I bring my uh, can I bring my maid? I mean, that's the most common scenario here. And that's like, yes, like you, you, you can. Um, there's a couple of requirements here. We'll kind of walk through them one by one. What's the uh, first requirement for the to, uh, for them to be able to for the, the foreign national to be able to bring their domestic employee? Uh, so the employee has to have a residence abroad and no intention of abandoning that residence, just like all the other B1s. Yep, same as all other B1s. What's the second one? Uh, so the employee has to demonstrate that uh, they have at least one year of experience as that personal domestic employee. You can't just be like, maybe I can like, sneak my mom in you know under this because you know a mom does like your mom doesn't qualify as a dependent uh say well no not unless your mom has like a year of experience um as a domestic employee what's the third requirement so the employee has to have been employed abroad by the foreign national employer is a domestic employee for at least one year prior to the date of admission to the u.s or the employer can demonstrate that they regularly employed a domestic employee over a period of several years uh, preceding the domestic employer's, uh, or sorry, employee's visa application. So basically, you have to say this person's either been working for me for a year abroad and now I'm bringing them with me, or I have been employing a maid or a nanny, but for whatever reason, the one I was employing didn't want to come to the US or, or couldn't come. So I found a different one, right? So, but you can show that you have employed nannies or maids or, or domestic employees in the past. Um, so you can't just decide on a whim, like, you know, you have a client that maybe is here on like an L visa for a number of years and then they have a baby and then they're like, well, can I bring in a domestic employee? It's like, well, you have no pre-existing relationship with a domestic employee, no, nor have you employed one abroad previously. So although you may have the need, you're not really gonna fit the requirements um so what's the fourth requirement uh so the employer has to pay round trip travel expenses from the foreign country to the u.s and then uh the the last requirement here is the contract there has to be a very detailed very specific contract we have a template that we use here but what are some of the key points of the uh of the contract uh so <clears throat> it has to stipulate uh, the employee will be guaranteed the minimum of the prevailing wage. Uh, the employer will provide free room and board. And finally, the employer will only uh, be the only provider of employment for that employee. Yeah, so there's a bunch of kind of other things we that kind of go into the contract, including it has to be in if they if they speak a foreign language, you have to provide a copy in their in their language. Um, but Big one that takeaway there is you have to pay prevailing wage, not minimum. So you can't in the state of Texas, minimum wage is seven twenty five an hour. Um, but the prevailing wage, at least like in Dallas, last time I checked was like eight something, like eight twenty. You have to pay the the higher of the two, which is the, usually the prevailing wage, depending. 
Um, so can a B1 domestic employee then work and be paid in the U.S.? Uh, yes, but unlike most work visas, the B-1 domestic employee has to actually apply for work authorization from USCIS after they arrive in the U.S. Which is a really weird and dumb, <laughs> it creates all kinds of problems because a lot of times they're being entered. Well, actually, I'll ask that question first and then we'll come back. How, uh, how long can a B-1 domestic employee come into the U.S. for? Uh, so they should be granted B-1 status for uh, six months or a year, or the B-1 status can match the employer's stay, just whichever is less. So typically the employer is getting more. They're getting, you know, two to three years of status. So the, 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 the domestic employee is getting six months to a year, but they're able to keep re like filing extensions or going out and coming back and resetting that status as long as the employer so if they're only getting six months, they can like just every six months go out and come back if the employer has like say two years and they're trying to just match it up. But the dumb thing is it's like, wait, well, I, I was just entered for six months, right? To work as a nanny, but I actually can't work as a nanny until I get an EAD. But right now filing for an EAD takes like five to six months. <laughs> so it's like, it's literally, you can be in a situation where you keep entering and getting six months but are unable to get an EAD and like not able to work. It's stupid. Anyway, it's one of those things that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It can be problematic, but yes, you do have to file for a work authorization document after arriving in the United States. Um, actually, we should circle back to, in general, if you have a B1 visa or B1, B2 visa stamped in your passport, for how long can you enter the United States? And, and at one uh, time? Generally six months. Yeah. We're going to come back to that a little bit later down when we talk about something else. But in general, up to six months. But remember, CBP always has discretion to limit that. So if they have serious doubts about your actual intentions, but you're like, man, no, 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 I'm really, I'm telling you it's true. I'm just going to this conference. It's two weeks. Then they may just decide, okay, we're going to give you two weeks. Uh, so remember, it's usually six months, but they have the discretion to do uh, less. And the max is usually kind of up to a year. So like, let's say you or here, and then because of COVID, you can't go home and say, oh, well, I want to file an extension. Great. You can file one six-month extension. Trying to find file extensions beyond a year uh, is like good luck, um, unless you have really good reasons. Like, I don't know, I'm seriously ill and receiving medical treatment and can't travel, then maybe. But outside of that, no. So quickly talk about the NAFTA, or which is now called the USMCA, created some exceptions for Canada and Mexico. Like they, you know, got some uh um some kind of additional permitted business activities. So what are some of those? Uh so those include sales, marketing, uh growth, uh manufactured production, research and design on behalf of a foreign employer uh distribution after sale services and general service well in general these are not too different than the sort of general requirements where it's like hey i can enter to do stuff on behalf of a foreign company um but there are some kind of uh, other exceptions in here that are a little bit more uh usable so what does distribution include uh, so that's transportation of goods or passengers in the United States from Canada or Mexico, or loading and transporting goods or passengers from the U.S. to Canada or Mexico with no unloading in the United States. Uh, ordinary uh, cabotage or point uh, land and delivering in the U.S. is not allowed. So basically, a Mexican truck driver can pick up a load in Mexico, drive into the U.S., dump it, and then leave. Uh, now, they can't, let's say, drive into the U.S., dump a load in San Antonio, pick up something in San Antonio, take it to Austin. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Um, but, you know, you could drive into San Antonio, dump something, maybe pick something else up, and then drive it back out. Um, so this does allow Mexican and Canadian truckers uh, to enter to dump and like pick up a load, but you can't do any dumping or picking additional dumping or picking up inside the U S. Um, what does general service include? 
Uh, so tourism personnel may be admitted to attend or participate conventions uh, or conduct a tour that begin begins in either Canada or Mexico. If the tour begins in the U.S., on the other hand, then it must terminate in a foreign territory, and a significant per portion of that tour must be conducted in a foreign territory. So if you have a tour bus that like loads up in Toronto and says, hey, we're going to drive down in Ni Niagara Falls, and first we're going to look at the Canadian side, and then we're going to cross the bridge and look at the U.S. side. Well, obviously, the, most of the people on that bus are actual just regular tourists, right? But what about the person who's kind of in charge of conducting, you know, the lady standing there at the microphone, pointing out all the sites and talking, I mean, she's getting paid her job. Um, you know, she's technically working when she's crossing into the U.S. saying, well, that's generally uh, allowed. Um, what about the tour bus operator? So, again, we're kind of talking about like the bus driver. So a tour bus operator can be admitted to the U.S. with a group of passengers on the tour bus <clears throat> as long as it has begun and will return to either Canada or Mexico. Um, also, you know, a tour bus operator may be admitted with a group of tour passengers who are going to, you know, get off in the United States as long as the tour bus operator will return with you no know, passengers or reload with a group uh, to take to Canada or Mexico. And then uh, finally, a tour bus operator can meet a group of passengers on a tour bus that will end uh, <clears throat> the, the main portion uh, in either Canada or Mexico. The key here is it's like, it's a tour bus. Not a regular bus. A regular bus is just going to be picking up and dropping off people all over the place. A tour bus may drive to a bunch of different locations in the U.S., but it's with the same group of people. It's the same, you know, 50 people you loaded up in Mexico, and you're now driving them all around, showing them the sites, and then you're going to leave with the same 50 people. Um, so, in general, tour buses, you know, originating in Canada or Mexico, you know, the, the driver and stuff can enter the uh, U.S., um, so those are kind of like some of the key ones relating to sort of NAFTA, right? You're looking at a lot of that just cross-border traffic and truck drivers and, and tour buses and stuff. Um, again, this actually, this is kind of under that same umbrella, but, uh, who is, or what does it mean to be visa exempt? Uh, so this is pretty straightforward because it only applies to Canadian nationals. Uh, they're visa exempt, so they don't need to apply for a B visa at a U.S. consulate or embassy. So basically, a Canadian just shows up at the border with their passport and says, I'm going to Disneyland. They say, OK, <laughs> uh, as long as it's a Canadian passport, uh, they don't need a visa. They don't really need to do anything. And what's the and they can also be entered for the same amount of time as someone who has a visa. They basically treat you like someone who has a visa, but you don't. So you can be entered for six months um, and, and all that, uh, you know, all the same stuff that applies to a regular uh, tourist uh, visa. So basically they treat you like you have one, even though you don't. Um, which is differentiated from some people sometimes think it's the same thing. It's not, but differentiated from the visa waiver program. This is different. So who, what is the visa waiver program? So the visa waiver program is basically an alternative to the B visa for nationals of certain approved countries who can apply for admission uh, to the U.S. without a B visa after registering with CBP's electric system for travel authorization. So also known as ESTA. Yeah, so a couple of key things here. It's a limited number of countries uh, that are in, allowed in this program. You say why are some or some are not allowed? There's a couple of factors, but it has to do with people that have like countries that have low rates of uh, visa abuse that have agreed to share certain um, uh, security information or, or meet certain security standards. Um, you know, those countries are uh, allowed to participate. But again, one of the key differences is again, um, you do have to register with CBP, the ESTA system. You do have to register in order to use it. There is an exception, though. We're going to test you here. Do you know what that exception is? 
Um, no, I haven't worked with Esta enough. Land borders. So let's just say I'm British and I want to fly into the United States. I have to register with Esta. Uh, I have to register in Esta in order to be able to, to do that. Uh, but if I fly to Mexico and then cross a land border, you don't actually have to be registered in ESTA if you're crossing a land border. Um, it's a weird exception. But anyway, I'm going to just throw out, I'm not going to the whole list of countries, but just to give you a flavor here, you're looking at Australia, Austria, Belgium, um, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany. I'm starting to see a, a trend here. Um, most of Europe, uh, Western Europe is under here. Um, you know, Ireland, Italy, um, also uh, Croatia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia. We like our, a lot of our Eastern Europeans too. Um, Japan, Taiwan. Um, about the only one in the Americas is Chile. Uh, they uh, are actually part. So like Mexico, Central, pretty much all of South America. No, they have rates of abuse and whatever that are too high. Argentina actually used to be on the list, but they uh, got taken off a while back. Um, but anyway, it's what, 30-ish some countries. So if you're from one of these countries and you have a passport, you go to the CBP website, you register for ESTA, and then you should be able to travel to the uh, U.S. Uh, for how long can someone enter the U.S. if they're entering on ESTA? Uh, maximum is 90 days per entry. So upside is you don't have to apply for a visa, but the downside is there are some limitations that, right? So first off, you're limited to 90 days. Um, is there a per year limit? Uh, 180 days per calendar year. So if CBP is paying attention, they should not. So if you do 90 days and then you leave and then come back and do another 90 days and then leave and come back a third time in the same calendar year, if CBP is paying attention. Of course, sometimes they miss this, but if they're paying attention, they should deny you entry. Um, saying, nope, you've already used up all your time. Uh, are there any other limitations? Uh, <clears throat> so yes, in general, the individual that enters on ESTA cannot file a change of status or apply to adjust status, uh, to, you know, basically get their green card. Uh, this prohibition does not apply to immediate relatives or applicants for asylum. Yeah, so if you enter the U.S. on ESTA, but then marry a U.S. citizen, you could file an adjustment of status, so application for residency, or if you uh, file for uh, asylum. This creates a conundrum because, um, you know, you have a lot of people that enter, especially now during COVID, that are like, well, I can't uh, I'll go, can I file a change of status to investor, to E? Can I file a change of status to O? Uh, like, you know, the embassy's closed in my home country. I can't get it. It's like, well... No, you can't file a change of status if you entered in ESTA. You have to apply for the visa and then leave, apply for the visa in your home country, and then come back. Um, again, now, especially during COVID, this has created a lot of problems, right, with people's uh, being able to, to work. The second conundrum we have, too, is uh, with the e-visas, because the e-visas are tied to specific nationalities. So let's say you're from Venezuela, and you have a tourist visa stamped in your passport. Well, if you enter as a Venezuelan, you'll get six months. And if you enter as a Venezuelan, you can hypothetically file a change of status because you entered on a tourist visa, not ESTA. But we don't have a treaty with Venezuela. So if you wanted to do an E, you can't. But let's say you have dual nationality with Italy. So you're like, well, we have a treaty with Italy. Can't I uh, enter as, a, as on my Venezuelan passport, on my tourist visa, get six months and file a change of status to E based on my Italian nationality? Well, no, there's a little caveat to the law that says they're only going to consider the nationality on which you entered. So even though you have the Italian passport, they're only going to consider your Venezuelan. So you can't you're like, well, well, if I can't find a change of status to E, if I enter on my Venezuelan passport, well, then I just enter on my Italian passport. Right. And then I'll, well, if you're entering on your Italian passport, you're using ESTA and you can't file a change of status. So it's like, damn, if you do, damn, if you don't, if I enter on my Venezuelan, I can't file a change of status. In general, you can, but not to E, because your E is based on your Italian nationality, which you didn't enter on. And if you enter on your Italian nationality, you're probably using ESTA. But 
I guess if you were able to get a visa actually stamped in your Italian passport, not use ESTA, but get the actual visa, which you can do, uh, then you could enter as a tourist and file a change of status. Um, obviously, we saw that when Trump did the travel ban. So you had people that were like, had a British passport, but were born in Iran. And they were no longer allowed to use ESTA. And they actually had to go, even though they're British citizen, with British passport, which normally would qualify for visa waiver, they had to go and get a tourist visa stamped in the passport, which is annoying. But the upside was that now if you want to file a change of status or get more time, get six months instead of 90 days, you can do it. Um, here's another interesting question. <clears throat> so let's say I enter on my ESTA. I got, got my 90 days. My 90 days is about to expire. And I'm like, oh, well, I need another 90 days. Uh, I'm just going to pop down to Mexico, maybe up to Canada, I don't know, maybe over to the Caribbean, uh, and then come back. And then I'll get uh, another 90 days, right? Uh, no. So basically, Mexico, Canada, or any adjacent islands, if you go there and re-enter under ESTA, uh, you'll maintain the same validity period. They're not going to extend it. You have to actually travel outside of North America and the Caribbean to request that additional 90 days. So we had this happen recently with a client who drove down to the border and was going to do like a, a flagpole entry. And of course, we were like, no, no, don't do that. Uh, they're not because they're like, well, I've been here 85 days. If I go out and come back, they'll give me another 90. It's like, no, if you go out, if you do a flagpole entry at the Mexican border, they're going to give you five days. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to give you what's left on the 90. You got to kind of pierce the North American bubble, go outside it and, you know, fly to Costa Rica or, you know, to Europe or, you know, so wherever um, in order to request an additional uh, 90 days. <clears throat> so a couple key over overarching points here. Can you enter as a tourist for certain business activities? Yes. The majority of those either relate to, hey, I'm trying to set up something here, like invest and set up, and then I'm going to go apply for the visa, or I'm just doing something on behalf of a foreign uh, employer, uh, which is allowed. The things that they're always looking at, especially when you're, when you're actually applying for the visa at the U.S. Embassy, is immigrant intent, right? Do you have a travel history? Do you have uh, uh, a foreign residence? Do you have strong home country ties? Um, to determine whether or not you're eligible for the visa. And then of course, once you get the visa and you're actually flying into the US and you're staring at CBP, right? They're just looking at, well, what is it that you intend to do? Like, what is your what is your purpose for coming? Do we believe you? And uh, you know, they can enter you for up to six months, but maybe less on their discretion. If it's ESTA, then it's 90 days. Um, obviously don't go to school. Don't actually like work and get paid. Those are violations and hypothetically, if you like work and get paid, technically your visa is automatically void, even though it, they don't maybe know about it yet. It's technically void. Um, so it's best to do the right thing um, and and be uh, careful. And again, they can search your phone. They can search your computer. They can you know look at business cards. So just be careful there. Um, you always want to make sure that you don't run into any issues. Because if let's, let's say, for example, you have ESTA and you get denied an entry, you no longer have ESTA. And you can no longer get ESTA. Uh, in general, there's some exceptions there, maybe. But in general, you now have to go apply for a tourist visa. Um, and then, of course, the embassy is going to be like, well, what happened? They're going to have questions and, and doubts as to uh, the, you know, what happened. And should they even give you a visa? So it's best not to play games, to um, <clears throat> know what you uh, can and can't do, know the limitations. If you have any doubts or questions, you know, reach out to us or uh, any you know, immigration attorney. Andrew, any final thoughts on the tourist visa or status? No, I think we hit all the points on this one. Yes. And again, like everything we've talked about, we've tried to cover the basics. There's also also a lot of nuance and subcategories and stuff. So, if, you know, something didn't come up that. Maybe you have a question about, shoot us a, a, you know, an email or reach out to us, schedule a consultation. Uh, like always, we remind you to download our application, Law Pilot Guardian. It's a free application that you can, has a lot of useful information, especially about knowing your rights uh, for people that are, are here. 
Um, there are some paid features that are really cool too that are mostly for people that fear having um, run-ins with uh, immigration. Uh, of course, we're constantly adding new features uh, to the app to make it you know, more useful for everyone uh, when it comes to uh, the immigration world. Otherwise, uh, you know, stay tuned. We're almost done with our um, series of videos on the non-immigrant visas and we'll be transitioning over to the employment-based residency options, which will be um, a lot of fun to discuss. But thank you for turning in and we uh, hope to be back soon.